Okay, Greg, thanks for joining us. We're going to have just a minute or two. We'll have a, a little, uh, give everyone a, a minute or two if they're, they're just dialing in now um, for the webinar to start. So, yeah, thanks for the time yesterday as well. That was a great talk. So, um, that's up on the website now, so people can dial into that and, uh, and re watch what you went through yesterday. But um, you sound, yeah, so sound very busy at the moment. Yeah, um, ridiculously busy. I mean, um, I think I mentioned yesterday our website says we are open 24 7. Yeah. Um, and we're pretty much working 24 7 at the moment um it's one of those things in this industry you can't not do something straight away because timing is key so if somebody finds their dream home you can't say to them okay give me a week and i'll get you an agreement in principle on that home um, and yeah. we need to be able to do it straight away for them so um we, we pretty much make ourselves available whenever somebody needs us so i've got as an example i've got three clients who are making offers on properties today that i need to make sure that we can get that mortgage agreed today for them so um yeah the the, the uh that was the long answer and the short answer is yes we're very busy very busy yeah, yeah. full on well it's good to it's good to hear there's yeah, lots of things going on it's uh, i know it's has its fair amount of stress and uh everything on but yeah it's good certainly um everyone we've spoken to so far yesterday you know there's everywhere everyone seems busy like all the property projects and everything at the moment so it's definitely a busy sector yeah absolutely absolutely Cool. All right. Well, okay. So if we want to, yeah, we'll make a, a start then. So do you want to start by introducing them um, to Greenacre and yourself then, Greg? So go yeah. Um, so um, uh, obviously my name is Greg, uh, owner of Greenacre Financial Services. Um, we, we are pretty much, uh, our main focus is mortgages, but we, we um, the company has been going for about four years. I've been in finance my whole life. Um, and we do, um, we have access to over a hundred UK lenders. Um, so that we can always try and find the best deal for people. Um, we do uh, normal mortgages, we do buy-to-let mortgages, do limited company mortgages, we do specialist finance on properties, we do equity release, pretty much any type of finance that exists on land or property uh, in the UK, whether it be residential or commercial, we do. Um, we also do insurance to support that, so whether it be life insurance to protect the mortgage or home insurance, um, and that's kind of uh, the core of our business. Great stuff, thank you. All right, and you've um, kindly prepared some slides, so we'll, we'll go over to those for today's talk then. So this is all focused around uh, property investments and, and kind of what people need to be aware of. So if we um, kind of get into, I know you wanted to talk about existing homes and, and opportunities really in that space. Yeah, I, I think that um, with the kind of initial lockdown and even the second lockdown, people have spent more time at home. A lot of people want to uh, expand their home or a lot of people just want to add value to their home and I think that just a few things to kind of mention and, and about you know adding value to your home um, uh, your residential property um, how how that works what you can do how we finance it and the kind of benefits of doing it that way um, so I guess um, you know the simplest thing is that um, property in the UK has always maintained a very good value and a big reason for that is obviously the, the demand is always there we have a shortage of housing in the uk um, and that shortage will last for a long time we're still a long way away from anywhere being close to uh, meeting the demand that's needed so the value of property has always remained a good investment um, and i think that that's a, a key thing about the uk economy hence why the property market has been able to stay open and, and be uh, and do so well throughout yeah. 2020 um, and I think that because there's that demand, anything you do to a property, and especially in the southeast, um, you're going to add value. So if you do do an extension, if you do a conversion, um, you're going to add value to your property. Um, and I think that um, you know there's, there's lots of different things that people are doing. We've done a, a number of projects this year where people have added value to their property through various means. So just as an example, whether it be a single story extension at, uh, at the back of a property or a double extension at the back of a property, um, we've helped people um, buy property and completely knock it down and rebuild it. And, and that's, you know, still made huge amounts of profit. Um, and that's because, you know, as part of that, you're adding, you, you can add a huge amount of value. There's a lot, it's, it's certainly worth looking at, uh, planning rules in your local area and you can get that off a of local web local council websites that give you what planning permissions are available um, you know without much uh, you know without the need for even planning permission initially but also then what's going to be accepted if you did go to planning and if you can extend a property or add a loft conversion or add bedrooms or whatever you, you, you're generally going to add value 
Um, and I think that um, one of the things with it being your residential home is there's no capital gains tax on that. So adding value to um, an investment property, you know, not to get too much into tax advice, um, that you should certainly seek an accountant to advise on that. But, um, you know, you will pay capital gains tax on a investment property, but on your residential home, whatever value you add is yours. Um, and I think that's always a good thing because you're not going to lose money by investing in your own property. Um, you know, you're not going to have to pay tax on that, uh, on that capital uh, investment uh, or that, that capital growth. Um, so that's certainly something to consider. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you can finance these types of projects. So just for example, if you want to, if you bought a house that needed a huge, essentially knocking down and rebuilding, um, you might not be able to finance that on a standard mortgage, but there are uh, options that you can do to finance that. So we've done two this year where um, our clients have taken what's called a bridging loan, which essentially the reason it's called a bridge is you're bridging the gap between the day that you buy the property and the day that it is mortgageable. So you take a bridging loan, you can maybe knock down the property, get the finance together to rebuild that home, um, making it worth more than it was originally, you know, maybe, you know, ex extending or whatever it is that you're doing because the property was in such a bad state before. Um, and then you can then get a mortgage to pay off that bridge at the end. And we've done lots of those. Um, as I say, we've done two this year, but we've done lots previously as well. Um, but other things, so self-build, um, you know, you might have a plot of land that's got permission to build a house. Um, there are self-build uh, mortgages, um, you know, where the, the lender will release the money in, in phases as you're building the property. So that's something that uh, we've done and we can do as well. So, you know, another potential investment there is, you know, land that you know you'll get permission on or land that maybe already has permission to build. Um, you know, there are ways of financing those type of projects um, and just while we're on the subject of finance i guess if you are extending a property or you're looking to do a loft conversion or whatever it is um you know the standard process would be to get raise money uh, on a normal mortgage whether that be from your existing lender or be albeit as part of a remortgage and we've obviously done a lot of that this year because people have wanted to raise money to do these types of projects um so whatever it is that somebody's looking to do whatever type of project they're thinking about doing um be it all those that I've just mentioned, we can normally find the finance to suit what it is that somebody is trying to do. And I think that the, the key thing to bear in mind that if it is your existing home, being that it's your residential, there are a lot of benefits of doing it. One, you benefit from a bigger house, so that's that's great. But two, the value that you're adding, um, as I say, you're not going to pay, the, there's no capital gains. Um, you know, if you had a house worth 400,000, spent 100,000 on it, and it's now worth 800,000, that 800,000 is your money. Um, you know, whereas if this was on a, an investment property, you, you know, there is a capital gain tax to pay on that. Right. So that's something that's certainly worth bearing in mind. Yeah. Good, good. All right. Great stuff. Thanks. So then the next area, which um, I know you sort of touched on briefly yesterday and since you're going to more like now, the, the buy to let area. So that's always intriguing. Yeah. So um, again, you know, there's different um, misconceptions in uh, that you, you might see out there, but we're still helping lots of people either grow their buy to let portfolio or start a buy to let portfolio. Um, and, you know, there's still a huge appetite from lenders to um, to do this. Um, I guess the biggest growth area is um, on a limited company basis. And the reason for that was kind of what I was mentioning before uh, in the previous slide around the tax side of things. And again, don't take my advice on tax, get it, you know, you speak to an actual accountant, but um, with a buy to let property, there are certain tax implications, whether that be on the rental income that you're receiving, or if you were to sell it, the, you know, the capital gain that you've made, again, there's tax implications there. Whereas, so that, so the kind of new strategy that a lot of people are doing is um, buying a buy to let property um, through a limited company. Um, and that might sound complicated, but, but it's actually not. Uh, it's literally simply, um, instead of, Joe Bloggs buying a property, it's Joe Bloggs Limited buying a property. And, um, you know, we can assist with the advice in terms of how you set up that company, how you uh, then do the mortgage in that company name. We, we, we do limited company mortgages for people to be able to buy that property. And, and as I say, the main benefits to that is, is the tax side of things. Um, you know, as a, as a company, it's different tax implications than as an individual both on the income that you receive on the buy to let, but also when you come to sell it, there's different tax implications there. So a lot of people are doing it, lots of lenders are offering it, um, and, and it's certainly something to consider. And, and obviously, you know, the general consensus is it, it, it's still worth buying uh, or investing in property, 
um, especially on a limited company basis. Um, so I, I think that just the, the things to bear in mind is most lenders will require 25% as a deposit for that. There are a couple of lenders, but this was pre-COVID, uh, that would allow 15 to 20% deposit, um, but only in certain areas. And there's, there's reasons for that, uh, which are too complicated to go into at this stage because it would take too long. Um, but, but certain areas of the country where the yield is very good, the rental yield, um, you used to be able to get away with a low deposit than 25%. And that may come back, but at the moment, I think if you're gonna think about investing in property um, as a buy to let, you need to be bearing in mind that it, it, you need a minimum of 25% deposit um, to be able to do so. Um, and then separate to that, if, if, if limited company you didn't feel was the right thing for you or an accountant advised that it, you wouldn't benefit from a tax point of view, standard buy to lets, you know, we're still uh, doing a lots of those. We're still, um, um, that's still a busy area for us, whether it be, you know, you've got an existing buy to let that you want to take some capital out of to, to be able to, to, uh, to, you know, expand that, that property, you know, do, do some investments into that property. If you want to take some money out of, of that, um, you know, we can remortgage an existing buy to let, maybe take some capital out so that you can do an extension on that or do, you know, um, a, a conversion or refurb. Um, that's an option as well. So, you, you know, you can take capital out of um, a buy to let property to do that. Again, up to 75% of the property value. Um, so if you've already got it in a personal name, we can remortgage it in a personal name and try and get some money out to allow you to um, either grow the portfolio or actually refurbish that property and, and, and add value to it. Um, lots of lenders obviously uh, still have a huge appetite for that. And that's something that we're still doing a lot of. Great, okay. Brilliant, thank you. Um, in terms of, I guess, then looking at raising capital, the, the different yeah. options that exist. Um, so obviously I've touched on a few of them, but but just to kind of reiterate, um, whether it be that you've already got an existing buy to let, um, or whether it be that you're existing residential home, if you have capital within that property, um, and we're talking, you know, not kind of like 10% of the property value is capital, we're talking, you know, you, you've got a decent amount, whether it be residential or the buy to let, um, if there's capital there, there are normally ways that you can release some of that capital um, to be able to do whatever it is you want to do. It might be that you want to add more properties to your portfolio. It might be that you want to add a first property to your portfolio, or it might be that you want to refurb the existing property, whether that be the buy to let or that residential. Um, and that's something that lots of people are doing lots of different ways of doing it. So the, the first option there is a remortgage. That essentially is basically, you know, your current deal might have come, be coming to an end. Do you want to change lender? And as part of that change, get some extra money out of the property so that you can do uh, the things that we discussed there. Um, the second charge option basically means if you're a, if you're in, a, a, you might be tied in for three, four, five years, and it might be not worth you remortgaging to a new lender. Um, you, if there is equity in the property that you want to release, we can do that on what's called a second charge basis. And um, all that means is first charge is the mortgage, the second charge is a second mortgage essentially on the property um, to release that, that funds. And just to keep it simple, let's say you've got a house worth 200,000 pounds, you've got 50,000 pounds that you owe to your existing mortgage, you wanna raise another 50,000 pounds, we can do what's called a second charge mortgage to get the other 50,000 pounds out. You now have first charge 50,000, second charge 50,000, still got plenty of equity in the property and that will allow you to do what you wanna do. And then when your mortgage does come to an end, the fixed rate, you can then remortgage all of that, those two, two elements back together into one mortgage. Um, and then you just have one mortgage of £100,000. So that's something that you could do to avoid um, paying an early repayment charge. And then just in regards to other things, as I said, we do do like lots of specialist finance. If it is um, a big project, you know, not necessarily, you know, if the property maybe ne does need knocking down or you've got two properties next to each other that need not, uh, you know, merging into one, uh, converting into one, then, then that's something that can be done. Whatever it is that somebody's trying to achieve, there's always a finance option available to do that. Uh, and we've done that. So whether it be a bridging loan and, and all bridging means is you, essentially you're bridging the gap between what you want to do today to get it to the point that it's mortgageable tomorrow. Um, yeah. so, so that's why it's called a bridge. So there's lots of different specialist options available. Um, you know, let's just as an example, you might buy a pub that is no longer a pub that's not been used as a pub for a long time. You might want to convert that into five flats. That is not going to be financed through a normal mortgage. That might be development finance or something like that. Um, and again, we can do those types of projects if that's what somebody wanted to do. Um, and then the last thing to mention is, is equity release. That might be 
um, where a, a parent's got a lot of equity in their property, not necessarily working, maybe retired. They think they can't release money because they don't have the income for it. Well, actually they can. Um, equity release is, is something that's not related to your income. Essentially, it's releasing equity from your property um, to be able to, I don't know, gift to your children so they can get on the ladder or they can buy a bigger property, whatever it is they want to do. And, and just on that, last thing on equity release is it, it, it used to have a bad reputation in the industry. It's not like it used to be. It is heavily regulated. Um, it is something that um, you can't end up in negative equity, for example. Um, and it is something that there's more lenders there. There's more choice. There's more options available on that. So it's not like it used to be. Great. Okay. Good, good. All right. Plenty there to think about as well. Thank you. Um, and I guess just sort of touching on the current climate, really, of yeah, the impact of, of this year and what you've seen. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I guess um, I guess the main thing is is that, and especially during lockdown two, um, the mortgage market has remained uh, open throughout the you know the property industry. Estate agents are open, uh, valuers can go out, mortgage brokers are open, lenders are open. Um, you know the property market is so important that it has remained open throughout. Um, so um, I guess the main thing is, is don't listen to anything you sort of see in the media, because a lot of that is, is, is huge misconception um, that we, it is fully open for business and um, interest rates are great, depending on the loan to value. It's one of the best uh, times to have uh, to borrow money, essentially, uh, in terms of interest rates. There's some really good deals out there, whether it be remortgaging, purchasing, whatever it is, um, you know, that's something that's key. Um, yeah. I think, you know, the amount of mortgage business that's being done now is probably, you know, two, three hundred percent more than this time last year. Um, I think the only things to be aware of, the two sort of things to, that you should be aware of is um, high loan to value. So if you wanted a 90 percent mortgage, that, that there is a lot of restrictions there. We can do it, but there's just less lenders offering it. Uh, anything lower than that is fine. Um, and I think payment holidays, I think it's worth noting and, and worth being aware that this is not free money. Um, it's there for people who need that break. Um, to, you know, they might, in, their job might be affected, their business might be affected. Um, and it's there for those people that, you know, can't pay the mortgage uh, to, to help them get through that period of time. I, I, what I would advise on that is that, you know, it's not worth just taking a payment holiday for the sake of it. And the reason for that is there may be, you know, firstly, that that interest doesn't just disappear, that that monthly payment just doesn't disappear. It will either get added on to the mortgage at the end or it will get added on. And, you know, your monthly payment might go up come the end of that payment holiday. Um, but also if, if, you know, let's say you took a three month payment holiday now and then in month four, you wanted to um, change lender, remortgage, take some exploring out, you know, to a lender, you've, you've basically told them that, you, you know, you're struggling at the moment. So you need that payment holiday, which is fine. But then you then want to come to the lender and say, can I get a better deal or can I uh, take some capital out that there is you know, potential implications there where a lender might ask you about that. So it's something to think about. It doesn't mean that that is the case. You know, in month four or five, you might your business might go back to normal. You might back at work. The lender would consider that. But I think it's just certainly something that I wouldn't just apply for it for the sake of it. I'd apply for it if you need it. But if you don't, then it's, it's, it, it's yeah. worth thinking about whether it's the right thing for you. Good advice. Yeah. Good, good. OK. All right, that's brilliant. So we'll um, got a few questions that have come through, so we'll come on to that in a sec. But um, just to, to recap for anyone that's watching, so within the exhibitors area, Greg's um, company profile for Greenacre there is, is available there. So if you click into that, uh, he's offering everybody a, a free consultation, kind of any questions, anything you've got, any scenarios you want to discuss, then uh, Greg and the team would be happy to discuss that. So simply go to his profile, you'll see a form like this within that, fill that in. Uh, or, or Greg's available for live chat over the weekend as well. So just simply click that button and you can uh, have a run through there with uh, Greg and the team. So we're going to we've got a couple of questions here, which I'll just try and uh, get in some sort of order that have come through. So I'll just stop sharing the screen for a sec. So, um, so there's a question here around bridging uh, the bri and, and actually just more like clarification of, of so, so you can have a home and buy a second project and that's basically that kind of that's that facility i think they're just clarifying yeah. so, so bridging can be used in many different scenarios the reason you would get a bridging loan is if whatever you're trying to buy is unmortgageable so if I, i'll give you the two scenarios that we've done this year one property um, had had somebody living in it for 70 years and um, unfortunately she passed away um a couple of years have passed and then eventually someone wanted to sell it. Unfortunately, the pro property wasn't classed as habitable. 
So um, trying to get a mortgage on it where it's not habitable, basically the kitchen and bathroom were non-working, non non-operational, um, we, we couldn't get a mortgage. Um, what the person who was buying it wanted to do was to buy the property, re, uh, re renovate the property, uh, refurbish the property, um, and then eventually live in it. So there is a gap there between I want to buy it now, I then want to refurbish it, and then I want to live in it. That gap can be financed with a bridging loan because you're bridging right. the gap between the day you want to buy it and the day that you're then going to be able to mortgage it. So that's that scenario. The other scenario um, where it, it, you know it's useful. So I had a property where. Um, you have property next door to each other, so semi-detached house, one on one, um, again unhabitable, and the client wanted to knock the property into one property. You can't get a mortgage on one side if you're also then going to merge it with another side. That there's, there's, there's implications there because of the way that um, the mortgage is going to be registered at land registry. Essentially, it's going from two properties to one. So the applicant took a bridging loan, spent 12 months renovating the property, refurbing it into one. It then became one habitable home. Then we get a mortgage to pay off the bridge. Um, and essentially, or, or, or another example might be, you might be trying to sell your residential home, but you have no buyer um, and you want it, you need to buy it. You might have found your dream home that you want to buy. Yeah. Um, and obviously in theory, you need to sell your home to finance the, prop, the, the one you're buying, but that sale hasn't gone through yet. You can bridge that gap. So there's a gap there between you buying and you selling. So you could buy the new property on a bridging loan, knowing that you're going to be able to pay that bridging loan off when your property is sold. It's just that your property is going to take longer to sell than the one you need to buy. So right. we've done that in many scenarios. So you, you, you essentially just think of it as it's bridging a gap between the finance that you need being available, which is not available yet because you haven't sold your home and being able to buy that property. I think the only thing that with a bridging loan, you need to know what your exit strategy is. You wouldn't just take a bridging loan uh, you know, for the sake of it. You know, If you're going to borrow a £500,000 bridging loan, you need to know that you can borrow £500,000 on a mortgage to be able to pay that bridging loan off or that you're going to sell your home and there's £500,000 equity to be able to pay that bridge off. So um, it can be used in many scenarios, but you need it, it would have to be the right scenario with the right exit strategy. Sure. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, and then two others, and they're both on self-build actually. Uh, one is asking, okay, so what, what happens if your budget goes up? So I guess there's lots of scenarios. People go into a self-built project, see it every week on grand designs where it's like they were going to spend this, they ended up spending that. How do you sort of uh, um, think ahead? So it's released in, the reason it's released in phases is, is for that reason. Um, what a, what right. a lender is essentially doing is if you're saying that when the build is complete, the property will be worth a million pounds. And you might say, I've got 500,000 myself, I need to borrow 500,000. They'll release, let's say 100,000 day one, 100,000 month one, 100, another 100,000 month two, another 100. And you might say, actually, look, I'm going to need to spend a bit more. You've got some flexibility because you know, you, you wouldn't, the, the, the lender's not financing the whole project, you're financing some of it yourself. So you actually you might need to say, actually, I need to increase the mortgage to 700 now. I'm still yeah. going to be putting through, you know, 500 myself, but it's just that the price has gone up. You know, a lender will still look at that because there's, a, there's, there's, there's enough loan to value, there's enough equity to be able to do that. Right, okay. The reason it's released in phases is because if that does happen, you can readjust the proportions that you need and when you need them. Um, it is a specialist type of finance. So, you know, you can't just walk into HSBC and say, can I have a self-build uh, mortgage? Because they don't do them. Yeah. Um, so there are certain banks that do them and, and essentially it's more um, the relationships there throughout that project. They're not, you know, they understand that things can change and, and that will be adjusted as the project is moving forward. So we would look at, you know, if that's a potential, we look at, you know, finding a lender that is potentially going to be a bit flexible uh, and be able to release. You might need less money. So, you know, that might happen. Um, yeah. Again, that, that's different as well. Okay. And that sort of ties into the sec second part of that question, which you've touched on, but what do they actually need to have? So what do you, I guess, like, how, how do you put forward your case for what you want and what you it's going to be worth? And what it's well, so if, if your income dictates that you can borrow £500,000 as a normal mortgage, then essentially they're willing to lend you £500,000 as a self built mortgage, which they release in phases. They wouldn't lend you a million pounds if your income only dictated that you could borrow £500,000. Um, so I guess the first part is it is income relevant. Um, but, um, and in terms of what else you would need, you would need like, you know, a builder's uh, quote, you need an architect plan, you need to show that you've got everything in place and, and, and how you've come to know that it's going to be worth this at the yeah. end and it's going to cost this, uh, the estimated cost is this throughout. So, so you, you, you have to have like a business plan for it so they can see why do you believe it's going to be worth this and what money do you need and what money you're putting in. Sure. That's part of it. But also the maximum they'll lend you is going to be a proportion of the property, no more than the value of the property, obviously, um, yeah. but also within your income uh, affordability, essentially. Sure. 
Because at cool. the end of the self build, all you have is a normal mortgage. It's so yeah. you've gone 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. Eventually it's finished. You've now got a 5,000 pound mortgage and it's just a normal mortgage then that carries on. It's yeah. just that they've released the money in phases um, up until the point that you have completed the home. Yeah. And then it's just a normal mortgage which carries on for however long you want it to carry on for. Brilliant, yeah. I think there's quite a few people that will be dying this weekend that are thinking about building their own home and, and that's the key area for them. So good, good. So yeah, just to recap then, so if you have any other questions for, for Greg or the team, then just um, go into the, the profile and uh, and get in touch via Greenacre. So yeah, Greg, thanks again so much. That was really insightful and, and great advice there. So um, yeah, pleasure talking to you and uh, have a good rest of the weekend, yeah. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Cheers, Greg. Thanks, mate. Cheers, bye-bye.